Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. Two Tactics of Social Democracy in the Democratic Revolution published July 1905. Chapter 3. What is a decisive victory of the revolution over Tsarism? The resolution of the conference is devoted to the question, the conquest of power and participation in a provisional government. 1. As we have already pointed out, the very manner in which the question is presented betrays confusion. On the one hand, the question is presented in a narrow way, it deals only with our participation in a provisional government and not with the party's tasks in regard to a provisional revolutionary government in general. On the other hand, two totally different questions are confused, viz, the question of our participation at one of the stages of the democratic revolution, and the question of the socialist revolution. Indeed, the conquest of power by social democracy is a socialist revolution, nor can it be anything else if we use these words in their direct and usually accepted sense. If, however, we are to understand these words to mean the conquest of power for a democratic revolution and not for a socialist revolution, then what is the point in talking not only about participation in a provisional revolutionary government but also about the conquest of power in general? Obviously our conferences were not very clear themselves as to what they should talk about, the democratic or the socialist revolution. Those who have followed the literature on this question know that it was Comrade Martinov, in his notorious two dictatorships, the new Eskrists are reluctant to recall the manner in which this question was presented, even before January 9-6, the date of Bloody Sunday, in that model of tail end I writing. Nevertheless, there can be no doubt that it exerted an ideological influence on the conference. But let us leave the title of the resolution. Its contents reveal mistakes incomparably more profound and serious. Here is the first part. A decisive victory of the revolution over Tsarism may be marked either by the establishment of a provisional government, which will emerge from a victorious popular insurrection, or by the revolutionary initiative of a representative institution of one kind or another, which, under direct revolutionary pressure of the people, decides to set up a popular constituent assembly. Thus, we are told that a decisive victory of the revolution over Tsarism may be marked either by a victorious insurrection, or, by a decision of a representative institution to set up a constituent assembly. What does this mean? How are we to understand it? A decisive victory may be marked by a decision to set up a constituent assembly? and such a victory is put side by side with the establishment of a provisional government which will emerge from a victorious popular insurrection. The conference failed to note that a victorious popular insurrection and the establishment of a provisional government would signify the victory of the revolution in actual fact, whereas a decision to set up a constituent assembly would signify a victory of the revolution in words only. The conference of the Mensheviks, or New Iskra, fell into the very same era that the liberals. The Osvobozden II are constantly committing. The Osvobozden II group prattle about a constituent assembly and bashfully shut their eyes to the fact that power and authority remain in the hands of the Tsar, forgetting that in order to constitute one must possess the power to do so. The conference also forgot that it is a far cry from a decision adopted by representatives, no matter who they are, to the fulfillment of that decision. The conference further forgot that so long as power remained in the hands of the Tsar, all decisions passed by any representatives whatsoever would remain empty and miserable prattle, as was the case with the decisions of the Frankfurt Parliament, famous in the history of the German Revolution of 1848. In his new Rhenus Zetung 7, Marx, the representative of the revolutionary proletariat, castigated the Frankfurt liberal Osvobozden Tsai with merciless sarcasm precisely because they uttered fine words, adopted all sorts of democratic decisions constituted all kinds of liberties, while actually they left power in the hands of the king and failed to organize an armed struggle against the military forces at the disposal of the king. And while the Frankfurt Osvobozdensei were prattling, the king bided his time, consolidated his military forces, and the counter-revolution, relying on real force, utterly rooted the Democrats with all their fine decisions. The conference put on a par with the decisive victory the very thing that lacks the essential condition of victory. How was it possible for social democrats who recognize the republican program of our party to commit such an error? In order to understand this strange phenomenon we must turn to the resolution of the third congress on the section which has seceded from the party. 2. This resolution refers to the fact that various trends akin to economism have survived in our party. Our conferences, 
It is not for nothing that they are under the ideological guidance of Martinov, talk of the revolution in exactly the same way as the economists talked of the political struggle or the eight-hour day. The economists immediately gave currency to the theory of stages, 1, the struggle for rights, 2, political agitation, 3, political struggle, or, 1, a 10-hour day, 2, a 9-hour day, 3, an 8-hour day. The results of this tactics as a process are sufficiently well known to all. Now we are invited nicely to divide the revolution too in advance into the following stages, 1, the Tsar convenes a representative body, 2, this representative body decides under pressure of the people to set up a constituent assembly, 3, the Mensheviks have not yet agreed among themselves as to the third stage, they have forgotten that the revolutionary pressure of the people will meet with the counter-revolutionary pressure of Tsarism and that, therefore, Either the decision will remain unfulfilled or the issue will be decided after all by the victory or the defeat of the popular insurrection. The resolution of the conference is an exact reproduction of the following reasoning of the economists, a decisive victory of the workers may be marked either by the realization of the eight-hour day in a revolutionary way, or by the grant of a ten-hour day and a decision to go over to a nine-hour day. The duplication is perfect. The objection may be made to us that the authors of the resolution did not mean to place on a par the victory of an insurrection with the decision of a representative institution convened by the Tsar, that they only wanted to provide for the party's tactics in either case. To this our answer would be, 1, the text of the resolution plainly and unambiguously describes the decision of a representative institution as a decisive victory of the revolution over Tsarism. Perhaps that is the result of careless wording. Perhaps it could be corrected after consulting the minutes, but, so long as it is not corrected, the present wording can have only one meaning, and this meaning is entirely in keeping with the Osvobos Denii line of reasoning. 2. The Osvobos Denii line of reasoning, into which the authors of the resolution have drifted, stands out in incomparably greater relief in other literary productions of the newest Christs. For instance, the organ of the Tiflis Committee, in the Georgian language, praised by the Iskra in number 100, in the article the Zemsky Sober 3, and our tactics, Social Democrat, 8, organ of the Tiflis Committee, published in the Georgian language, praised by Iskra in number 100, goes so far as to say that the tactics which make the Zemsky Sober the center of our activities, about the convocation of which, we may add, nothing definite is known as yet, are more advantageous for us than the tactics of armed insurrection and the establishment of a provisional revolutionary government. We shall refer to this article again further on. 3. No objection can be made to a preliminary discussion of what tactics the party should adopt in the event of the victory of the revolution as well as in the event of its defeat, in the event of a successful insurrection as well as in the event of the insurrection failing to develop into a serious force. It is possible that the Tsarist government will succeed in convening a representative assembly for the purpose of coming to terms with the liberal bourgeoisie, providing for that eventuality, the resolution of the Third Congress speaks plainly about hypocritical policy, pseudo-democracy, a travesty of popular representation, something like the so-called Zemsky Sober. 4. But the whole point is that this is not said in the resolution on a provisional revolutionary government, for it has nothing to do with a provisional revolutionary government. This eventuality defers the problem of the insurrection and of the establishment of a provisional revolutionary government, it alters this problem, etc. The point in question now is not that all kinds of combinations are possible, that both victory and defeat are possible, that there may be direct or circuitous paths, the point is that it is impermissible for a social democrat to cause confusion in the minds of the workers concerning the genuinely revolutionary path, that it is impermissible to describe in the Osvobos de Nianana, as a decisive victory that which lacks the main requisite for victory. It is possible that we shall win even the eight-hour day, not at one stroke, but only by a long and roundabout way, but what would you say of a man who calls such impotence, such weakness as renders the proletariat incapable of counteracting procrastination, delays, haggling, treachery and reaction, a victory for the workers? It is possible that the Russian Revolution will end in an abortive constitution, as was once stated in the period, 5, but can this justify a social democrat, who on the eve of a decisive struggle would call this abortion a decisive victory over Tsarism? It is possible that, at the worst, not only will we not win a republic, but that even the constitution we will get will be an illusory one, a constitution our last ship of, 9, 
but would it be pardonable for a social democrat to obscure our slogan of a republic? Of course the newest realists have not as yet gone so far as to obscure it. But the degree to which the revolutionary spirit has fled from them, the degree to which lifeless pedantry has blinded them to the militant tasks of the moment is most vividly shown by the fact that in their resolution they, of all things, forgot to say a word about the republic. It is incredible, but it is a fact. All the slogans of social democracy were endorsed, repeated, explained and presented in detail in the various resolutions of the conference, even the election of shop stewards and deputies by the workers was not forgotten, but in a resolution on a provisional revolutionary government they simply did not find occasion to mention the republic. To talk of the victory of the people's insurrection, of the establishment of a provisional government, and not to indicate what relation these steps and acts have to the winning of a republic, means writing a resolution not for the guidance of the proletarian struggle, but for the purpose of hobbling along at the tail end of the proletarian movement. To sum up, the first part of the resolution one, gave no explanation whatever of the significance of a provisional revolutionary government from the standpoint of the struggle for a republic and of securing a genuinely popular and genuinely constituent assembly, too confused the democratic consciousness of the proletariat by placing on a par with the decisive victory of the revolution over Zarism a state of affairs in which precisely the main requisite for a real victory is lacking.